ignore what I may have said in the past. This is the hardest study that I've ever done. So this artist was picked by my Discord friends in a quick poll and requested a couple of times on this channel. But today we're going to take a look at the beautiful, honestly delightful work of Marco Bucci. Just like with Cynics and Ahmed Alduri, Marco is one of the OG YouTubers that I personally have learned so much from. I feel like his tutorials are probably some of the best out there. They are always jam-packed with so much information that you'll probably not find anywhere else on the internet. So this is definitely a super scary video to make, but consider this a fangirling session. Like I said, this video has been requested a fair few times, so massive thank you to Ethan, Yeni Arts, and Prane, and my Discord friends over on my Discord server for choosing this video. I hope you guys all love it and that it's everything you've been looking for. If you're a style study veteran, thank you so much for coming back. I love you, and you can go ahead and skip to part one. The timestamps are in the video description but if you're new here hi welcome i am so glad you're here and if this is your very first style study please do listen to the rest of this intro style study is a regular series we do here on my channel where we take a look at some of our favorite contemporary artists analyze their work and see what we can learn from it keyword learn we are not here to plagiarize someone's work or copy anyone's style we're only here to see what we can learn from their style and use to find our own unique art style. I usually structure my style studies in three parts. In part one, we'll take a look at Marco's work, analyze his style and see what we can learn from it. Part two will be a study of one of his original paintings. The really cute reference I've chosen today is this one. And in part three, we'll apply everything that we learned today to an original painting of our own. If you enjoy this video and learn something today, then please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. It really helps the channel out so, so much and I appreciate it a lot. But without much further ado, grab a snack, sit back and let's dive into another style study featuring Marco Bucci. Marco Bucci is an illustrator and art teacher based in Toronto, Canada. He's been fairly open about his art journey where he initially felt like he lacked the basic artistic talent that he saw in his peers and how he felt like there was no chance for him to have the career that he dreamed of. At around age 19, he decided to start studying classical art and that was the point where he began to actualize his dream of working as an artist. And honestly, his is an incredibly important story because it is one thing to be a gifted, talented creator or a child prodigy, but a whole other thing to take charge of your artistic path and achieve success entirely due to hard work and passion. And as a result, Marco's absolutely stunning use of color, light, and texture make for some incredibly emotive, powerful storytelling. This gorgeous art has garnered him over 650,000 subscribers here on YouTube and over 62,000 followers over on Instagram. In an interview with Voyage LA, Marco mentioned how a lot of his personal work is based on scenes that remind him of his own childhood and a lot of the characters are ones that he wished existed at the time. And so it is no coincidence that most of his art has a very children's illustration-y vibe but in a way that will appeal to people of all ages. We'll look at this a little deeper today. In fact, as it turns out, Marco has actually worked with a lot of big companies that probably featured very heavily in your own childhood such as Disney, Lego, Mattel and Fisher Price among others. And although his portfolio has a lot of digital paintings, they all have a very painterly traditional look and feel to them with lots of brush texture and a lot of hand of the artist type details. So today, instead of looking for the usual suspects such as proportions and compositions as we usually do in style studies, I actually really want to focus on the rendering aspect of Marco's art because there are so many beautiful details in his 
his work that all serve the biggest focus of every one of his paintings, and that is the story. I suppose in a way you could say that when it comes to his art, Marco is a recitalist. Speaking of lists, here's four key characteristics to Marco's art. Remember a minute ago when I mentioned how Marco's paintings have a children's illustration-y feel while also being super intriguing to people of all ages? Rather than the story or composition, I think this has a lot to do with the colour palettes that he uses. Because unlike with the usual children's illustrations, where every element is more or less the colour it actually is, the elements in Marco's paintings are heavily influenced by their surroundings. So rather than having skin that is entirely peachy or brown, you'll see that it is heavily coloured by the background. So here, her face has tones of blue, purple and yellow, all reflected from the background. And here is a great comparative example of this where the same exact scene has vastly different colours purely based off the lighting. This is what I like to think dynamic colour is, is how every colour bounces onto and off of every other colour, creating this beautiful sense of movement around the scene. Plus, looking at the actual colour schemes, you'll often find that Marco uses more complex palettes such as a split complementary or tetrad combination, this is another big reason why, although the subject matter may be very reminiscent of childhood, the painting itself doesn't feel dated or unappealing to grown-ups. It's like he takes these childhood-inspired scenes from your memory and makes them come alive on canvas. Lighting is probably Marco's strongest suit because there is so much complexity and nuance that goes into how he lights a scene. Generally speaking, we tend to create paintings that have an ambient light and a key light and call it a day at that. But looking at Marco's art, you'll see ambient light, a key light, a secondary key light, rim light and bounce light. Clearly, he knows his lights. But what interests me is that he doesn't just use lighting that will flatter the the character or subject of his painting, because you'll see that in some paintings, the character is hit with all of the key secondary and rim light, while in others they are hit with just a flat ambient light. So lighting isn't just there to serve the aesthetics. But let's take a look at this painting, which is an amazing example, because here you'll see that although there are five characters in the scene, only one is lit by both the primary and secondary key light. All of the others are floating in ambient light alone. And as a result, you can tell exactly which of these is the main character. Whereas in something like this, you still have multiple characters, but they are both hit with an equal amount of lighting. So both of these characters are equally important to the scene. In other words, Marco has used lighting to establish a hierarchy among the characters in the first scene, while in the second one he uses relatively flat ambient lighting to create the opposite effect. And then you have a quick sketch like this one, where you see that selectively lighting the building gives us a pretty clear idea of what time of day it is, or maybe what the weather is like in this scene. Or here, where the light passes through the water to hit the shark's teeth, making it the focal point of the scene, even though there are other brighter elements above the water. And this is why I wanted to focus on the rendering aspect of Marco's art, you guys, because rather than just rely on compositional elements and framing, he actually uses the lighting to tell stories. Now, this one is going to be a little tricky to explain, so put your listening ears on. You see all those sketchy details in his paintings? At first, I almost wrote it off as stylistic choice, just a fun personal flair that he adds to his work. But the more I saw of these unrefined sketchy areas, the more I started to notice a pattern. If you look closely at where he places these sketchy brush strokes, you'll see that they are almost never 
at the focal point. So here you see that the unrefined bits are in the hair and the background, and here they are on the Grim Reaper's cloak thing. Generally speaking, having scribbled areas like this creates a lot of visual noise, and visually noisy areas tend to draw your attention heavily. But if these are all the non-focal point areas, why would he want to draw your attention to them? Well, my friend, I have two words for you. Sensory overload. By creating a bunch of visual noise in the less important areas, he's creating so much noise in your mind that you are forced to seek out a visually quiet zone, and that leads you straight into the softer, more refined, visually quiet focal point of the painting. So here, for instance, you have a lot of noise in the background behind the kids, even on the kids' clothing, hair, and bunny ears. In fact, there are only a couple of important focal points in this piece. The first is, of course, the face. It is softly blended, creating a restful space for your eyes to stick to. The other point of focus is actually the apple, and what do you know, it is softly blended out as well. In this portrait, which is a little more realistic, you'll see the super sketchy marks in the hair and the pearls, whereas the face is really well blended and refined, and your eye wants to rest on the face to try and balance out all the noise around it. Pretty clever, eh? Okay, so now that we've established that Marco uses scribbly brushwork to drive attention to the softly blended, refined focal points, let's look at a slightly more subtle detail within these refined areas. Looking closely at the characters' faces, for instance, you'll see that while it is all really well rendered, there are some areas that are significantly sharper than others, and these areas generally lie in the eyes. You'll see a lot of really sharp pixels in the iris, usually surrounded by a contrast of softly blended whites of the eye to push that sharpness even further. In fact, I suspect he uses a sharpen tool in those areas areas rather than a sharpened filter, because you'll sometimes see a bit of colour noise in there as well. However, it is not always the eyes that are the focal point. In this painting, for instance, you'll see the majority of the sharpness around the edges of the owl's feathers, maybe even in the branch that they're sat on. Or in this piece, where although you have a character, the focal element is the knitting, and so that is where all the sharpness is at its highest. The point is, he uses every single aspect of the painting to tell a story, and that includes includes which details are sharpened. Another amazing effect you'll see is that there's this almost palpable texture, like here for instance, where it feels like you could reach out and touch the leaves and you would feel the texture, or here with the fur on the monster, or the hair on the character's head, it's like you could touch it and it would feel bumpy. I think that is an amazing extra dimension to add to a static digital painting. With traditional art, you often have this element by default because the paint builds up on itself and creates that bumpy texture. But with digital art, this is an element you literally can't count on because it is just a screen. And I think this is a severely underrated detail in Marco's work because it is actually really difficult to emulate that texture. I'll show you a shortcut on how to do this in part 3, but it will obviously not be nearly as good as painting the texture by hand, so let's just appreciate the detail here, okay? So, to sum up part 1, here are 4 key characteristics to Marco Bucci's art. Number 1. He uses very dramatic colours in complex combinations to add a ton of sophistication to children's illustration -y compositions, making them super interesting and dynamic. 2. The lighting isn't just there to flatter the character or build up the aesthetic value of the scene, it is actually a pretty strong element of storytelling. Number 3, he uses a lot of rough, scribbled brushwork to create so much noise in the background elements that you are forced to look for the quieter, more refined and softly blended focal points in the piece. 
And number four, Marco creates some super sharp details within the softly blended focal point to avoid it being drab and static. He also creates a lot of texture that makes you feel like you can just reach out and feel the bumpiness of the surface. In this way, he's able to better emulate the look of traditional paintings. Okay, let's talk about this study because oh my god, there is so much I learned. This was the reference I chose because this is the iconic monster that is so unique to Marco's work. I started without a sketch today because having watched Marco paint over the years, I know he's not the biggest fan of having a very structured sketch. I started by blocking in the colours of the background and then made a huge shadowy blob for the monster. I found that for this style, you want to start with the shadow tones and then build up the brightness because that way you're able to really play with the lighting and not worry about making things a little too dark. I also made sure to put down the bigger areas of rendering first before going in and painting the eyes and the mouth. I actually felt quite intimidated by the eyes, mostly because they are different sizes and nothing like human eyes. They're a lot simpler compared to a human eye, but you know how when you get into the habit of painting something complex and then it's way harder to simplify? I think my favourite part of this process was that for some reason my eyes weren't hyper fixated on one part of the painting at a time. As you can see, I was constantly going back and forth around the scene, and I think this has to do with the style, because everything in the scene is rendered in a similar way. So the painterly effect in the monster's mouth is the same as the effect in its fur, is the same as the texture of the background, and so on. So it's not like the fur is rendered one way, the mouth another, and the eyes a third way, so it's actually really easy to dart around the entire piece and build everything up to a level before going in and building it all up another level and on and on. I honestly felt like this was loads more fun to do than finishing one part then moving on to another. Why? Because it keeps your mind engaged constantly. You're not going to get bored spending hours on just the face then doing a few hours on the background and so on. It's like a constantly shifting scenery. I think that is something I definitely want to try and incorporate in my own process because it's just so much more fun. Once I had a lot of the big stuff done, then and only then did I go in with a smaller brush radius and start to add the sharper details. Now obviously I can't replicate every single brush stroke and I really don't want to because it is so deeply seated in Marco's individual process with this painting, but I try to get as much detail in there as possible. And as you can tell, the vast majority of this painting was done super zoomed out and that is an important thing to note because it shows us how Marco's biggest priority is for the piece to be readable even while zoomed out. That was another huge lesson I learned this week. So here is the finished study and I love it so much. Since this style is so rooted in storytelling, I felt that for the original painting today, we ought to do a bit of a slice of life scene. So here is pretty much what happens every evening after I've worked out for the day. I make myself a giant mug of coffee, practice some Spanish on Duolingo, and then grab my crochet hook and go ham on some clothing. And there is almost always a little sleepy monster with his head leaning on my calf, begging to get all up in my yarn so he can scratch at it. As with the study, I started by blocking in all the big shapes. I wanted a couch in front of a large window and a table with my coffee on it, as well as a plant. I decided to go with a tetrad colour scheme, so I picked green and deep blue on one side of the colour wheel and orange and magenta on the other. I definitely wanted a warm, orangey late afternoon light coming in because this is usually around 4pm every day and I'm still working on getting the lighting to be more dramatic so like expect drama in all of my paintings going forward. 
But yeah, I wanted everything to have a strong backlight that hid the tops and sides of every element in the scene. One key element I noticed in Marco's work is that his shadows are super saturated as well. And since we have an orange light here, I went for an almost electric blue in the shadowy areas. At first I rendered her eyes to be human-like, but then decided to go for a rounder shape like in Marco's work. I definitely struggled with the floor because it looked so muddy, but ended up fixing it later in the process. Let's talk about the super sharpness though. Like I mentioned in part 1, there is this almost palpable texture to his work, and while you could paint it by hand, which is probably the best way to do it, I do have a couple of quick fixes for you. First, you could use an unsharp mask filter, so in the bottom left corner of the screen you can see a sphere that I painted like normal, and here is the same sphere with an unsharp mask filter. I set the radius and sharpness super high and you can see how it made a noticeable difference. This is a great filter to use for the sketchy noisy areas around the focal point. Another way to do this is to use a sharpen brush. This is a lot easier to localize because it only sharpens the areas that you paint over, but the drawback here is that you can't adjust the radius. However, if you do sharpen enough, you get that color noise effect, so this is what you want to use on the sharp areas within the softer focal points. So here, although I wanted the focus to be on the softer blends of her face and the dog's fur, I wanted a lot of it to lead to them looking at each other as well as to the crochet itself. So those are the areas that I ran the sharpened brush over. I ended up lightening the couch a lot and it looked so much better and I really love how this painting turned out. So here is this week's original painting, Coffee Time. And there we have it, Marco Bucci demystified. Like I said, this was definitely one of the hardest studies that I've ever done because it is so abstract. There are so many little sublime details in his work and I really hope I've done a decent job of trying to explain some of them today. Thank you so much again to Ethan, Yenny underscore Arts and Aprene for requesting this video. I do hope it's been everything that you've been looking for. And if the rest of you guys have enjoyed this video and learned something today as well, then please remember to like and subscribe it helps the channel out so so much. So which of your favorite artists would you like to see a style study on in the future? If this is your very first style study then make sure you check out my style study playlist first because chances are I've probably covered them, I've done a load of these, but in case I haven't then feel free to leave them in a comment below and I'll add them to my ever-growing list. Come say hi on Instagram and Discord and if you'd like to grab exclusive tutorials that I release every single week, I release a couple of extra videos over on my patreon so i'll leave a link to everything in the description below make sure you check it out but that's about all i have to say today so thank you so so much for hanging out with me today i'm guessing this was a long one but i do hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have like i said check out some more style studies up here and i'll see you guys on the next one bye